Hi everyone. Welcome this afternoon, Saturday, to the Zero One Garage. I'm Jamie Austin. I'm the curator and director of programs here at Zero One. And welcome, I see some new faces. At Zero One, we're an arts nonprofit where art meets technology to shape the future. And we've had this space, the Zero One Garage, open in downtown San Jose since 2012. And we have a year-round program of exhibitions, performances, and events. So if you're not on our mailing list yet, that's my one plug, um, you can sign up at the front desk and then we'll send you a note every month or so with all of the upcoming um, activities that are going on here. But welcome, our talk this afternoon is, is a second renaissance possible? The synergy of arts and science. And you know, a lot of times we focus on the intersection of art and technology, but there's so many amazing intersections out there to explore. And really the point of this talk is to show how interconnected things are and how there's different complementary approaches to looking at the same thing. And specifically, the quest to understand the origins of life is one that's been explored by artists and scientists alike. Um, some of the examples we pulled were the myth of Pygmalion, where a female statue comes to life. That was in Ovid's Metamorphosis from 8 AD. Um, the play by George Bernard Shaw, Pygmalion, that inspired the musical My Fair Lady. Um, is tied to this. Um, sculptors Rodin did a series based on this idea. Edward Burne Jones, the painter, um, and there's numerous painters throughout you know, the Baroque era and the Renaissance that did this idea of people coming to life. Um, and then when you go to the sciences, I mean, beginning Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species to the Miller Experiment of 1953, um, which is really the foundation that rebiogenesis, origins of life, the installation that you can see um, behind me is based on, um, and the starting point that my two guests today um, used for the project. Uh, when you're approaching these kind of intractable large problems like the origin of life, I think we all know that it's really important to approach these problems from different perspectives, through different lenses, with different backgrounds, um, and really the more kind of diverse perspectives that can be brought to it often kind of get you to a point of understanding or of realization or of discovery or of invention. Um, a, you know, a faster way than one single one. And our guest today, artist Adam Brown, who's next to me, and then scientist Robert Root Bernstein, um, really demonstrate exactly this. Um, both are based at Michigan State University, and they've been collaborating for around five years on a series of projects tied to the origins of life that are very deeply rooted both in the arts and in the sciences. And that's what the, we're going to be talking about today. And then I hope you spend some time afterward to, to explore a little bit more of the installation and the videos that are part of the exhibition here. Um, but to kick things off, I mean, with the title, Is a Second Renaissance Possible? The Synergy of Arts and Sciences. You know, maybe, Adam, we could start with you of kind of how, as an artist, did you get so kind of deeply pulled into the sciences? And also, how did you get starting thinking about, you know, the origins of life as an area of practice? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, I'm already mic. <laughs> Glad I didn't speak before. Um, so, as a, as an artist um, and as a human being, I think I'm interested in how life began, how there could be life on other planets, um, uh, what the difference is between living and non-living has been something that's very um, important to me to understand and I think there are a, a series of false dichotomies that we live with like that there is a difference between living and non-living um, that uh, there's dead matter versus live matter um, and uh, there's a, a long history within the sciences that I've been interested in too um, which look at vitalistic thinking versus mechanistic thinking, right? These are two other false dichotomies, perhaps. Maybe you guys don't think that they are false, <laughs> right? So vitalistic thinking means that there's something inherently special about life that you can't quantify. Um, a lot of this theory, the more contemporary theory, came out of France, like with Henri Bergson. Um, and then there were other thinkers, like Jacques Loeb and some other people that believed that life is mechanistic, like a clock. So if you, if you could understand how the, the workings of the clock and you could take it apart and put it back together, you could make something that's alive. And these two positions, in my mind, um, are, are not very accurate. I would rather take a third position, which would be more, maybe more of a neo-materialistic position, and that is that matter has agency. And so if matter is exposed to the right energy sources, in the right conditions, at the right time, 
then life will be able to build itself. Um, which then creates another dichotomy that life is, sim is simultaneously special and not special at the same time. And so that's a lot of what this installation is about. And if you move from left to right down the flasks, this is a mashup of all the different types of origins of life experimentation that's been done. Starting on the left side, you have freezing and thawing processes. So it's mimicking conditions on a planet before there was life, right? So one of the energy sources would be freezing and thawing, which simultaneously organizes matter and contracts matter. And then it goes to the next flask, which is UV light, the sun. UV light, of course, we know causes skin cancer and, and can manipulate on the molecular level. And though that, that energy source also moves molecules around in different ways to cause different combinations. Go over to the next, the next flask, that's kind of a central flask where everything comes back to. Then to the fourth flask, <laughs> uh, the five to do it in my mind here. The fourth flask um, has uh, a heating, uh, so you have like a hot spring and it also has desiccation that goes along with that too, so it can dry out. And then if you've ever had a, a good bowl of soup, you know that you have to cook it for a long time to sort of distill it all down and remove the water, and then all, everything is forced together. The molecules makes it more tasty. We want to have, have a tasty soup. And then we go finally to the, the last one where there's the, kind of more of the classic um, Miller version of this where there's an electrical strike, a lightning strike. So there's a Marx generator on the right, which is um, technology used, um, FYI, to detonate the first atomic bomb, um, and that puts out a 125,000 volt lightning strike that then um, adds to that mix, and then the whole cycle starts again. And of course, there's lots of permutations to try to figure this out. Um, so as an artist, um, I think as a scientist, we're interested in how all of these, these sort of social constructions and how we view life and how we view ourselves in the world um, is important. And I think that there's not a, a lot of difference between the, the, the two interests of, of art and science. Great. And Bob, I'd like to pass it over to you, too. And, you know, as a scientist, how did you end up here in an art gallery and part of, you know, these types of installations? Well, the story's pretty straightforward. Adam was hired at Michigan State about five years ago, where I've been a, a scientist for about 25. Um, one of the uh, things he was supposed to do was to reach out beyond the art program and make connections to other parts of the university. I don't think they quite understood what that was going to mean when they hired him. Uh, but he immediately started calling people up in engineering and physics and biology and all sorts of different programs, looking for anybody who was interested in the arts. I've been sort of an amateur artist all of my life. Uh, always very interested in the ways artists, artists and scientists interact. Um, I've done lots of formal studies of, of uh, scientists who have either affected the arts or used the arts in their work and things like that. There's actually a very nice correlation between getting a Nobel Prize and being a fine artist or a poet or a playwright or something like that. Um, it's about <laughs> 20 times more likely that, that a, a scientist who has a Nobel Prize will be engaged in the fine arts than, than the average scientist. So there's a huge difference. Uh, so I was, I've been interested in why that was the case. And so I've published on some of these things, and I know Adam came across some of what I'd written. Um, we're pretty sure he gave me a call. He may have emailed, we can't remember. Uh, we set up a lunch date, started talking, trying to sort of find where we had overlaps in our interests, and pretty quickly discovered that one of them was uh, the emergence of complex systems from simple ingredients. And more specifically, by the end of that lunch, we had started talking about the Miller origin of life experiment um, as a common focus where we, we both found really interesting things to do. Um, Adam, from more the artistic perspective, me from a scientific, um, and agreed that first thing we should do is recreate this thing and then start playing with it and seeing what you could do both artistically and scientifically that, that was new and interesting and so forth. Uh, one of the things that really attracted me to working with Adam was you just heard him explain what's going on. He can explain the science as well as I can. And so my 
challenge has been to understand the art process as well as he understands it so that I can explain it as well. He's, and he's I, getting there. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> so Jamie actually introduced us as the artist and the scientist. What we would really like to get out of this at the end is we're both art scientists or science art artists or whatever. I mean, there really isn't a good name for this at this point. But that those distinctions blur and just go away altogether. And one thing I know you both were talking about is how important it was for you an installation like Rebiogenesis to be a working installation, one that could operate both in a lab space and outside of it where real research could be done. Could you talk a little bit more about why that's important to you? Sure. Um, well, we're still producing work within a historical canon, right? There's still the, the history of art that precedes us. Um, and, and of course, uh, I think one of your students brought up uh, yes, uh, a couple days ago now um, was, was making a correlation between Marcel Duchamp and ready mades and his interest in producing um, artwork that also had science components like a bride strip there by her bachelor's even or the large glass. And um, the difference is, is that um, his piece was very much metaphorical. Of course, Duchamp had a big influence like many other artists. Um, but uh, the, the difference is, is I'm approaching this from a very ultra-realistic perspective. And that not only does the, the, the piece have to metaphorically and poetically speak about a certain subject or an, or an idea or a concept, but it also has to function. It has to work. And if it doesn't work, for me, then it, it, it's falling short. So if I'm making a claim, like in another piece, for instance, where I'm um, extracting uh, precipitating gold out of seawater, then I actually have to produce the gold and show in the palm of my hand here is this piece of gold. Just like here, if, if, if I'm claiming that we're creating a, an apparatus, we're um, creating a complex system that can um, result in various organic molecules that are important to life, then it, it, it has to do that. It's very important to me that what I claim does, does work. And from my perspective, it's, it's very much the same thing, but my goals may be slightly different because I'm coming from a different background. So one of the critical aspects for me and, and that I wanted to build into the apparatus um, dovetails very nicely with Adam's goals aesthetically. And that is, as a scientist and a teacher of students of science, it bothers me tremendously that when we teach science now, we strip people out of it, we strip the history out of it, we strip the sensuality, the emotion, and everything else. I am not a scientist because I like looking at tables of numbers. I don't think any scientist is a scientist because they love tables of numbers. Maybe there are a few. Maybe I'm overstating it. But I think what actually draws you into it is the beauty uh, the excitement of working with materials, understanding what the materials are capable of, being able to manipulate them to do something else and control them. That's all sensual. It involves hand-eye coordination, using machines, building machines, doing all sorts of fun things. And we go to the public and we show them the end. What I want is the process. And I want to put the people back in. And I want to put the emotions, the excitement, and the sensuality, and the you know, the, the touching and the feeling and the hearing and tasting and everything else. And what I really like about this piece is it does all these things. When this thing thing's operating and the Marx generator's going off, it produces ozone that you can smell. It produces this huge crack. We have watched people walk through the gallery and literally jump because they didn't know that, you know, they, they thought it was just this thing, right? And all of a sudden there's this bang and they turn around like, what was that? And then there's this flash, they want to know what's going on. They start engaging with it. Um, last night at the, the gallery walkthrough, we couldn't keep people from going up and touching it, mm -hmm. which is a little scary, but <laughs> when it's on, it's got electricity going through it. Natural but, selection. But this is good. <laughs> I mean, this, this is what, part of what I want this apparatus to do, because this is what science is really about. Um, on the other side, operating as an artist, even though we're trying to do scientific experiments, frees me as a scientist to do experiments I could never do otherwise. Okay, the standard way we fund science today is I have to write out a, a detailed proposal to say the National Science Foundation, here are the experiments I'm going to do, here are why they're justified, here's what the output is going to be, here I'm going to, I'm going to analyze it, the whole thing. This totally misses what Miller did. Okay, what Miller did was to recreate an environment. He, did, he hoped he was going to make amino acids. 
He didn't know that he would. He was actually told by his advisor, don't do this, it's not going to work, you'll never get your PhD. Well, he was lucky it did work. Okay, but everybody since then has been trying to figure out a specific reaction mechanism to make a particular kind of compound. Okay, that's crazy. That's not what nature did four billion years ago. Nature was an environment with all these possibilities, the kinds of things that Adam was talking about, the imminence of the materials coming together. What we have done here is to now recreate an apparatus where we can put any environment you can imagine just about, except maybe really high pressure ones, into this apparatus. We can recreate what it's like on the moons of, of, of Jupiter or Saturn. We can recreate what Mars was like, we can create, recreate different areas on, on the Earth. Um, and now we can look at what emerges when you do that. There's no way to get a grant to do that because people say, well, you're just speculating and you're just you know, going off and, and blindly and looking. That's exactly what we're doing. We are blindly going off and seeing what nature will tell us about herself. Okay? And if you set it up properly, nature will reveal what she's doing. So I can now do that. So as a scientist, this is incredibly valuable. And I can tell you already, we haven't published this, but it's going to come out fairly shortly. We've not only made all the amino acids that Miller made, we have made most of the major fatty acids and phospholipids. We have made ATP. We've made most of the uh, nucleic acid bases. We have made all the important sugars, glucose, ribose, deoxyribose. We have confirmation from mass spectrometry and things like that. It's all state-of-the-art analysis. And we've done this in one pot in about six weeks. Okay? Nature is really clever. We're really dumb. So rather than trying to tell nature what she should be doing and setting us up and making it happen, we're letting nature tell us how you do it. And so both from just getting in there and understanding nature, but also playing with it and letting you experience nature directly, this has just been a fantastic project. And for the not so scientifically literate, um, all those parts that he was describing, like the lipids and the sugars, they're basically all, it's, it's, the, it's the, the big Lego kit that we need to put together life. One thing that I think is interesting that's come up a lot in discussions with visitors last night is this notion of time. And in one sense, things seem to be very fast. Like you're saying, in six weeks, you were able to find all of these Lego building blocks. Mm -hmm. But then the other sense, you know, a lot of times the question is, so have you created life? And it's like, well, you know, human time is very different than universe time. And I don't know if you could talk kind of about the contrast of like short you know, time and long time tied to this work, maybe Adam? Sure. Um, so it's very difficult for us as human beings to think much past five minutes, right? And, and, and really we're just a blip in the universe. And, and we are, if, we, if you look at sort of a more neo-materialistic sort of perspective, um, we are contingent. That is, we could be here or we could not be here. And it takes a very long time for those things to happen. And so it's more interesting to look at things in terms of geological time, right? So for, in order for something to happen, it takes a lot of time, and it's very difficult for us to think of beginnings. Like, so this idea of origins, right? That means that there is a beginning, right? Which is rooted in, in our understanding of myth. You know, like Christian myth, for instance, like Adam and Eve, that there's a first man and there's a first woman. Now, um, no disrespect to that, that, that idea, um, I, it, it seems to me that that's probably not the case of how things happened if we, if we believe in evolution. And if we believe in evolution where there's small little changes over a very long period of time, millions and millions of years, and, and they're all by chance, and then those chance operations result in something sticking and being passed on to the next generation, then that means that there was no first of anything. There was no first human being. It's impossible. And just like here, if we're, if we're trying to create life from scratch, so to speak, then there wouldn't, that means that there wouldn't be like this moment, this aha moment where like presto, there's E. coli, right? Or presto, there's cupria vitis metalli durans, an extremophile or thermos aquaticus or something like that. It would, it would be something that we wouldn't necessarily be able to identify immediately because there is no immediacy. Right? There's, there's these long spans of time where things happen very slowly and we can't necessarily understand it because we don't live long enough and can't uh, appreciate time in that same way.
And actually, there's, there's another element to the, the, this new version that we've got up here, um, which you can actually see in the video over here, because it's been cycling through over and over again. You keep seeing the same thing. Well, that's actually really important for evolving systems. They have to go through cycles. And so we've added two things into this apparatus that nobody's ever done before, which is that we can cycle everything through as many times as we want. So we can go like through daylight cycles, we can go through freeze-thaw cycles, we can go through drying and re-wetting cycles over and over again as many times as you want. Nobody's ever done that. We can also select out. So far, everybody who's been doing origins of life experiments has been making things. They make lots of chemicals, huge number of diverse chemicals. <laughs> but evolution requires that you select among things non-randomly. Only some of them survive to go on to the next round. So because we have cycles, some of the things we built in like UV light or drying down are going to destroy some of the compounds. Only some of the compounds are going to make it into the next cycle. That's a different selection of compounds that were there first time. Which means now when we run it through again, we're going to get something different the second time. And then we're going to select through on those. And on the third round, we're going to get something new again. So one of the things that we can now do is look at time that doesn't just repeat, but it's sort of like a spiral. It keeps growing and changing as it goes. And that's also a really important way of thinking about time geologically and biologically. And why was it important for you to kind of bring that research again out of the lab, kind of present this? I know you've mentioned at one point that you're thinking of this a little bit more as an open source form of an installation where other people could come and kind of join in this area of research. Um, you know, you're, but what is the, you know, what are you, I guess, hoping to add to the project by kind of sharing it with larger groups of people that have different, you know, backgrounds outside of sciences? Well, I think there are a lot of possibilities here. I mean, one, well, the reason we actually have a National Science Foundation grant to fund the development of this project and disseminate it. And one of the reasons we got that grant was that we wanted to put this not only in science museums where you would normally go and see a science exhibit, but also in art galleries such as this one. And the point was to see that if you did live experimentation that, as I said earlier, brings back the sensuality and the emotion, the excitement, all those kinds of things to something. It isn't simply something you press you know, in, a, in a museum and it does something, but it's actually doing a real experiment where you don't know what's going to happen. Does that get people, perhaps such as the audience here, who comes in to see that experiment, artwork, whatever you want to call it, who would normally never be exposed to it? And if, by doing live experimentation within a, an art context, by making something that is a hybrid of science and art, can we reach out and excite people about science and its potential in ways that we normally wouldn't? And then vice versa, can you get scientists who normally don't think about art as being valuable to now see that the art is a way of generating ideas and making possible things that we never could have done before? getting back to the theme of what we're talking about, a second renaissance of putting these back together the way Leonardo used to think about them. The other part of it, too, is that um, what affects us more than science and technology today? I mean, everyone's got an iPhone, probably, especially in near Silicon Valley where we're at here, <laughs> right? And then and all of this, and the way that the, the paradigm shifts that result from uh, new ways of understanding the world through the sciences, so it makes sense that, that the, the arts need to get involved in that somehow, right? We need to be able to um, kind of moderate that progression so we can understand how it is that we sit in the world. Um, I, I sort of see the artist as kind of like a mass psychologist for everybody in a way, <laughs> like to help us, to help us you know, probe and understand what's happening all around us in the world so we can come to terms and understand grips with all those things. I hate to ask this question, but I feel like it has to come up. I mean, certainly, you know, everyone in the audience is interested in science and in the intersection of arts and sciences if they're here. Um, you know, but for a lot of the folks that kind of wander in and look at this and see live science experiment, and, you know, there's clearly a design and an aesthetic to the installation, but I'm sure you've heard the question before, and I'm just curious how you would answer it when people go, but how is this art? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that, that comes up sometimes. 
Um, so if, if, if everything up there was, was made out of a different material, like if it was made out of concrete, or if it was made out of clay or jello, <laughs> you would have no problem saying, oh, that's art, right? And the, the difference is that the, the materials that are up there have, have, have a discourse, have the language of science associated with them. That's really the only difference, and that it functions too, right? But otherwise, um, there's all kinds of aesthetic decisions that are being made too for, I guess, like I'm, I'm more of a um, uh, formal basis that, I, that I'm referencing as well. Like there's lots of the motif of circling the square, which is an alchemical symbol. And to me, alchemy is a really great way of thinking about how the artist functions, or at least how I function as an artist, um, which is kind of this sort of hermetic process where I, I follow an epistemic approach of research and I take that research and that information and bring it back into the arts and then perform creative activities to better myself as a person and, and to understand how I situate myself within the world. So that's why I like that alchemy reference. And so the circle of the circling the square is one of those, those um, symbols, it, it, which is a symbol of the philosopher's stone, which has lots of different meanings and functions. And so you see like in the Marx generator, you have a circle with a square. With the pumps, there's more circles with squares. The glass, the glass itself is another circle. And they're all sort of these angular connections with, 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 with circles. So on a very formal level. And then, and then of course, the, the whole table is illuminated. Now, if I was in a scientific lab and I was just doing the lab, doing the lab work, I could care less if the table was illuminated. Um, but here, I'm, I'm interested in referencing um, sort of this new materialistic idea, which is a, comes from uh, Deleuze, right, where he talks about, um, and this is, gets kind of heavy philosophy, but he talks about um, this plane of imminence, right? This plane of imminence where there's, where, where there's this description of functional space and removing the idea of Cartesian space. Cartesian space meaning there's an X, Y, and Z coordinate, here's a spot. Um, functional space, or, or coming out of calculus, is about rates of change over time. And that's what this plane of imminence was about, which is about these po this, possi this possibility of, of things happening, this possibility of things coming together through emergent properties. And that's why there, there's this illuminated sort of um, uh, edgeless kind of surface that everything's sitting on. So it's, there's, there, there's many levels, I guess. And, and all that's there in the science as well. I mean, the, the aesthetic that Adam is talking about now changes the way you think about the science so that the art becomes integral to it. So if you think about the apparatus, Adam's been talking about this plane of imminence, the apparatus is not a thing. It's not the way we think about most scientific apparatuses where you stick a, a sample in, you measure something. It is the embodiment of process. It's what could be. It's all the things that could be, which is a totally different way of thinking about setting things up. And at the other level, one of the reasons that I think that this aesthetic component is so incredibly important was actually stated by, there was an immunologist who came in last night to, to see the work. He also happens to be an amateur glass blower. He looked at it and he says, who is your glass blower? That is incredible stuff. That's really beautiful. Well, it's Scott Bancroft. He is a professional glass blower who works in the chemistry department uh, at Michigan State University. And he is an incredible glass blower. Um, but that's the whole point. There is this art and craft in everything we do as scientists that's been lost. We put it in a little black box and we don't know it's there anymore. This takes it back out. But it's there in all the science and the engineering the iPhone that Adam was talking about. I mean, everybody knows Steve Jobs thinks that you know the, 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 the design was as critical to every, as everything else. It is in the experiment. It is in the apparatus. It is in the way you think about it. And then it is in the way you design the experiment to work in that kind of a process-driven apparatus. Great. And I want to make sure that we allow a lot of time for questions from the audience, because I'm sure a lot of you have questions you'd like to ask to Bob and Adam. Uh, we do have someone running around with a microphone. We'd like to ask you that you would uh, use that and maybe introduce yourself briefly. Um, but are there any questions from the audience or, that you'd like to ask? And don't be shy. Harry. Could you, say, could you say some things about the cycling of the various uh, environments? Is that fixed, random? 
Um, well, right now it's set up to, to it's fixed in, in a sense that it moves from left to right like I described. It doesn't have to do that. It's all based off of program. So there is an behind the scenes, behind the wall, there's an industrial control system that we can program in any way we want. So we can make it go you know, from UV to freeze, from UV to freeze back and forth as many times as we want. It can, it can be adjusted in many different ways. So, I mean, really, there's, there's thousands and thousands of variations of process that you can involve within the system. And maybe if you had a good hypothesis about what was happening, you could engage that system in a way to um, help illuminate that. But the whole, the whole cycle right now is a 12-hour cycle, so you'd have to camp out here at zero one for a long time to really be able to see it beginning to end. Which, which then also, of course, gets back to the idea of human time versus geological time. And you know, one of the reasons that I would put you know, on the other screen down there, there's this really boring image of watching water freeze. Mm -hmm. um, so you, I, I'm certain if you're sitting in front of that, you really have nothing better to do with your time. Um, but I, but the thing that I like about sort of that process is that it, it's showing you something that no one's going to wait around to do because we're just not as human beings. So it, it kind of references that fact that this time lapse is very long. And really a 12-hour cycle the way it's set up now is really short. I would much rather see each process be like a week. And then, but that doesn't make necessarily for the best exhibition because then no one wants to wait a week to get to the next process. John. Hi, um, is this on? Yeah. I'm John Weber from UC Santa Cruz Institute of the Arts and Sciences. Uh, fascinating piece. I'm curious about a, a couple of things. Um, first thing is, which is a little more minor, um, so you're going to publish some results from this fairly soon. And I'm curious if, is that, if that'll be published in a primarily in a science text or in an uh, art science text or where. But what I'm more interested in is the question about how you think about the uh, engagement of the piece with audiences. And that's around the, the, the question of legibility and, and how, um, how you want it, it to be legible. It's, it is a very beautiful piece. I find it sculpturally very fascinating. And I'm reminded of Alan Capra writing in the late 60s that the, the lunar module is more, more interesting than the, the most recent experiments in, in sculpture. And I think you could say the same thing here. Obviously, you've thought a lot about the visuality of it and successfully. But how do you want, in terms of people looking at it, and you, the description helps us understand, those of us who are not as literate about amino acids and the formation of molecules, to understand more what's at stake in it scientifically, but, but for people wandering through the gallery, how do you want to, what do you want, what kind of, what's a good outcome <laughs> in terms of an interaction with uh, a lay viewer? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think we're kidding ourselves if we think art is not very opaque in general. I mean, I think any, any art piece, you, you really have to know a, pr a pretty extensive canon or a history. You know, if we're going to start talking about materiality and, and, and semantics of material, then you can look at Joseph Boys, and then you have to know something about that. So I think there are a multiple kind of levels of, of reads that somebody can get out of it. Um, and uh, hopefully there's enough here where someone wants to dig a little deeper, and maybe like the beauty that you reference is a way to pull somebody into figuring out what's happening beyond that. Um, and, uh, and other than that, I mean, I, I think it does, it does have some uh, inherent qualities that I hope people will walk away with. Like it does, you know, we were talking about having a kind of an altar sort of position, you know, like it has like this altar in the middle of space. And I think maybe people would reference that and maybe re reference their own religion perhaps and bring it into it. Um, or, um, uh, or maybe just be interested in the materials themselves and how they come together. Um, but mostly I'm hoping that, they, that people will take some more time in an ideal world and try to understand more of it. You know, and hence, that's also why you, when you work with a curator, the curator is also trying to figure out how to provide those kind of materials in order to educate a, 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 an audience to be able to engage with the work in a more deep way. So part, part of the engagement is from the design of this as an exhibition always involved having docents interact with people. So although they may not be available all the time, although I think there's always going to be a docent here, um, part of the object is to have someone available to talk to people and find out what their questions are. They know enough to be able to answer the basic kinds of things we're trying to do, the kind of conversation we're having here. Um, and we've talked about, you know, if you have a five-year-old, what do you want them to get a 
out of this versus a scientist versus an artist and so forth. So they have a different set of ways of, of interacting with people. Um, actually, one of the reasons that NSF funded this is because this is an experiment in communicating. So one of the things we're going to be doing is handing you all the survey, hopefully before you go. You don't have to fill it out, but we'd love it if you did. Um, and part of the research that's going on here is how do people respond to it? Uh, because we don't really know. This, this is a new way of trying to present both art and science in a way because it, it, it is integral. It is doing both the art and the science simultaneously. We don't know whether people will get that. We have put it up in science museums. I can already tell you from the data we've got, most of the people walking into a science museum don't get the arts and crafts part of this at all. They see an art, a science exhibit in a science museum, they see science and that's it. People in art venues have been much more open in seeing the combination of things that are going on and appreciating that, uh, which I think is a great sign. It may actually probably means artists are bringing much more to this than people who are just trained in the sciences. Um, and then the challenge, which you sort of referred to in the first question, is how do you then report all these findings and everything else we've got? Um, we have a whole series of publications which will go to many different venues. So we'll definitely be going for as high a, a profile science, you know, just straight. Here's the science we got done. It's pretty exciting. Nobody's ever been able to do some of the things we've done. Uh, you know, we, we want you to, to acknowledge the scientific productions that we've done for themselves. Uh, I'm one of the editors of Leonardo. Uh, I actually edit an art science section. Obviously, I can't put my own piece in there with Adam, but uh, we'll have to go through some kind of, go to Joel and make him add, <laughs> send it out for peer review or whatever. Um, and hopefully we'll get something in, you know, Leonardo and those kinds of places. Um, we actually have in our grant that we need to go to places like Aztec, which is the Associated Science and Technology um, place where we need to talk to the, to the science museums and science centers about, in this case, probably what they're not doing right, um, that they're not getting through to people about what's actually interesting about scientific experimentation and so forth. Uh, we need to go and talk to the people who uh, run art museums and things like that about you know, the potential of, of, of doing this kind of thing in their venues. Uh, it's got all sorts of potential um, places to go, and it's going to take a lot of time and effort to do all that, but that, that's part of integrating all this stuff. The other component of this, too, which, and this, this is kind of a, like the art person in me that, that kind of doesn't like what Bob's saying right now. <laughs> Um, I, I have and, to do and, the academic and, stuff to get the money to do this. <laughs> right, and, and, and what that is is that I, I reject the idea that everyone has to understand the work too. Yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, there's, there's a small group of us that are working with biological systems. And we, we all know each other, we're all friends, it's kind of a small family and there's certain curators that are doing this work. And so it becomes, I, I guess, a little bit inbred in some ways in that we're responding to each other we're, and, and we're making work and moving forward which I would have to think like the abstract expressionists in New York, you know, after, the, after World War II, were doing similar things. And, and if you read a lot of the reviews of those pieces, you could tell that a lot of people didn't understand what it was that they were working on and what they were getting at conceptually as well. So n everyone doesn't have to understand it. And, and as audiences and people that view the arts and patrons of the art, it's your responsibility to educate yourself. And I mean, just to add kind of a curator's note on all of that, I mean, these are all questions we've been thinking about. And I mean, certainly, personally, I've learned a lot um, just in reading and researching related to this exhibition. I had heard of the Miller experiment beforehand, but I probably couldn't have told you anything else about it. Um, I did study chemistry for about a year in undergrad before I switched back over to computer sciences. Um, so didn't, you know, have the in-depth background there. But I think really, I mean, what art is so good at is creating dialogue. And so really what we're hoping to do here is create a space where it's okay to ask questions. Um, we you know, did a lot of thinking of what is kind of the, the foundational information that people need to have in order to be able to start you know, thinking more deeply about the work. So we did make sure to provide more information about the Miller experiment specifically, about what's going on inside of those um, five vials, because everyone wants to know that, you know, some background about you know, the folks who created it. And I think what we learned last night, we had around a little over 100 people here. Most people asked amazing questions. 
coming from all different backgrounds. And we had probably around 25 of them actually sit down and fill out a two-sided in-depth survey. Um, and we're just thrilled that they had time to, you know, spend with the, uh, you know, collaborators who created this. And that was a nice kind of look of, you know, people wandering in off the street and really wanting to engage in thinking like this. So I think it's also, um, we need to challenge, you know, you and audiences, um, you know, to think in, in different ways. And that's what's been exciting about me because I've learned a lot from this as well. Yeah, one of, the, one of the best surveys that came back last night was actually, I think, totally on target. The guy basically X'd out the whole thing and says, I reject all of the categories you have here. There is no such thing that can be defined as science. There's no such thing that can be defined as art. And I'm standing there going, yes! <laughs> this is actually what we're trying to do. Um, unfortunately, to gather data, we start with what we assume the public thinks about. Um, but if we get to where we would like to be, the distinctions will disappear. It will work equally as science and art. We talk about authenticity. Um, this is why we have to get it out to the science community and, and they have to get a peer-reviewed paper out, okay? They have to say this works as science. It has to satisfy Adam's bio-arts people. Um, they're the best people in the world working at this. They are the professionals working on the fringes, developing the new, new arts. It has to work at that level. Um, I would love to see this be able to reach a wider audience. What they'll get, we don't know yet. Um, but we are creating a new aesthetic or we're part of people who are Korean, and we're not the only people, but we are helping to create a new aesthetic the same way every great art has done in the past. It will run into bumps. It's going to change how people look at things. Maybe it won't be understand that, understood now, but you know, 50 years of from now, people will understand it. Um, it doesn't matter, but it has to work at all those levels somehow in order to succeed. So that's, that, in a sense, is the answer to, to the original question. Right, and I think we have another question out there. Hi, my name's Blythe, and I, this is more of a comment or a suggestion maybe, but when I think about school science projects, and I was never into science and math, I was always in art and literature. I, we always hated the science part, you know, I have to do an experiment the night before you're thinking, what are you going to do? And I thought, well, what if it's a, an area where we, we train teachers to get students to think about art in their science projects? So I don't know if you're working with teachers or if you've ever been thinking about that or not, but just a comment. Uh, we haven't been doing that as part of this project. I've been doing that my entire life. Um, there are places that are doing this. I'll, I'll just give you one example. If you want to know how I've been going about this, um, the short answer is my wife and I wrote a book called Sparks of Genius. It explains how people go through the creative process in the same way in both the arts and the sciences and actually history and literature and, and lots of other things. Um, that was actually implemented in a school in Jerusalem. It's the only school that I know of in the world where uh, everybody starting in ninth grade on has the same curriculum. Uh, whether they are math students, science students, music students, or art students, they're all in one advanced school um, it's the best kids in all of these different disciplines crammed together. They form them into teams of four when they first enter the school. The, there is, so there's a math student, there's a science student, an art student, and a music student. All of them take the same core curriculum. You may not play a musical instrument, but you're going to learn one. You may be totally unable to draw, but you're going to take a painting class. You may be terrible at math, but you're going to have to learn, you know, okay. They are responsible for each other. So every student from the get-go becomes a teacher. They learn to work as a team across disciplines. Every year they have a, a key project. So the first one was one I designed. It was designing kites. And we then had a whole series of prizes. The kite that could fly the longest, the highest, do the most tricks, was the most beautiful, you know, and every student had to contribute to that. So they, you know, basically they had to figure out uh, you know, which one could lift the most weight, you know, whatever it happened to be. They had to do all the mathematical calculations, understand the physics and aerodynamics. They had to design something that was beautiful and use the art. Yeah, I mean, so each year they do something like this. These are the most sought after students when they graduate it, from, from this school in all of Israel. They get the prime jobs, whether they go into industry, the armed forces, or anywhere else because they all know how to work in teams, 
They all know how to collaborate. They all know how to find problems. They all know how to go out and find people who can help them solve the problems they don't know how to work on. They all know how to take art, science, and everything else, put it together, uh, engineer something, design it, make it work. It's a phenomenal thing. We can't do this if we just stop putting everything into these little stupid boxes, which don't exist in the real world. But for some reason, we start in elementary school, you get your English and your math and your, why? I don't, that's not how I was educated. It's not how you have to be educated. Okay. So we'll take two more questions, one over there, and then I think there's one in the front over here. So life as I see it is very colorful, and presumably your installation is dealing with life, and I was really curious about what considerations, if any, you gave to color in the installation when you created it. Color. Um, well, I, I don't think it's in there for the design of the installation, but this thing definitely evolves all sorts of beautiful colors in layers and all sorts of fun things. I mean, you can watch the chemistry happening over time. So one so of the one it, of the it makes its own. Let's one of the materials it produces was identified by Carl Sagan as tholin. It's like this brown mud, which is like it ends up being a UV protectant. So a lot of the color that comes out of it is is a, is a, a function of utility or what happens through the processes itself. Like we described those processes before. Um, the green is there because I have two choices. I can either go with pink or I can go with green ethyl glycine antifreeze. antifreeze. And I like green better. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it may, you know, it's, we tried to keep it fairly monochromatic. So you're starting with nothing. I mean, that's part of the idea is you're starting with nothing and you, you grow something. So well, it's got it, all the colors. It evolves. White. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> sure. It's got, it's got the potential for everything in it. Eventually, will the fifth beaker have a bunch of stuff that you can see? In? This one actually won't. We have not gassed it and put in everything we need because it's not quite to the point we don't, we trust you know putting ammonia and methane into um, an open source thing which anybody can walk up to. <laughs> um, we have done things like that, and yes, um, that's what that's what happened. It was finished like seven days ago. So. so. <laughs> Not completely safety tested. You're the first to see the world <laughs> premiere of the project, which is exciting. The friend, Joel. Uh, I'm Joel Slayton, the executive director here at Zero One. Um, you know, I, I, th I think we could argue that both artists and scientists have and create models of how we think the world operates and exists. Um, but I worry about the terminology that you know that, that we use around these sorts of uh, collaborations, uh, specifically when we you know the term intersection, um, because there's I, I hear what you're saying, but on the um, on the other hand, you know, evolving a new aesthetic and and um, a new way of of, of working and um, a platform that you know, can reveal co complex behaviors that might not otherwise be seen and to John's point, you know, how, how that, that can be interpreted by the audience in, in new ways. I think it sounds fantastic, but then we talk about the intersection and it goes back into this preservationist mode of, of a siloed world of disciplines and, how, you know, how is it going to, to you know, impact the art world or how is it going to impact the science world and I'm not sure what the right word is for what you do mm -hmm. you know have you thought have you thought thought about that further because somehow I think we're all being held back we have the same problem here the intersection of art and technology I mean, who cares right well uh, there, there are several answers that could be given to this um, and Adam I has some and I'll, I'll throw out a couple um, one is, I've tried to get away from it by just talking about problem or, or um, uh, challenge directed activity. I mean, again, even the language for this is difficult. Um, if we want to create a self evolving complex system, that's a challenge. Um, we can narrow that down a little bit by saying, I want to do it by recreating the kinds of chemical systems that are in the world as atoms work with electronic systems as well. So that would be another way to define it. In this case, we define a chemical system. Um, how then do you go about
creating something that can do that. I don't care about any of the terminal. I don't care whether this is science or art or, or any of those other things. As I said earlier, you know, we were introduced as a scientist and an artist and um, yeah, that's my profession. I have to have an office somewhere and I have to, my colleagues don't know what to make of me. Some of Adam's colleagues don't know what to make of him. They certainly, my science colleagues certainly don't know what he's doing in my lab. <laughs> but I'll tell you, they come and check up on what he's doing all the time because it's a lot more interesting than what they're doing. So there are all sorts of really interesting boundaries being crossed. We don't think about the boundaries. We think about the challenge we set for ourselves and how to solve it. And you know, because we have to get money to continue this, yes, I have to go out and, and have a scientific publication. I have to prove that, you know, I, I satisfied that. Yes, we have to go to exhibitions like Ars Electronica, uh, which may be seen as, you know, more an arts thing or even an art technology thing. It's still got a label um, because you have to get it out there and show somebody something. Uh, you can't just sit in your little laboratory or your atelier and do it for yourself and nobody ever sees it. That has no impact. That won't change anything. So um, again, that's part of that aesthetic we're trying to get to is the aesthetic would be destroying all of those boundaries and creating a new language. Do we have the new language yet? No. I, I, don't, I don't think it's even necessarily important to think about a new language at all. And the only time I have these conversations is when I'm forced to stand in front of all of you and, answer, and, and ask question, answer questions like that. I don't really think of it that way in my day-to-day -day existence. Um, you know, but for me, the, my own personal practice is that the art is kind of the impetus for why I do everything. You get an idea and you try to make it come about. And I usually try to pick problems, like Bob is saying, that are hard enough where the scientists and a collaborative team can get interested in it yet easy enough where we can actually do it and solve it. So it's, it's a, it takes a lot of sort of studying and, and trying to understand the nuances of the discipline that you're trying to integrate into. Um, but one of the other things that becomes challenging is that they always want to, or I've had a lot of difficulty with this, is that art organizations still want to propagate the idea of the famous artist. And so if I'm working with a collaborative team and I want to give credit to all those people that I'm working with, it's really, really difficult to get them to print those names. I've had, I've had arguments where I'm yelling at curators on the phone because they're not, they're not, they're not incorporating, <laughs> no, <laughs> because they're not incorporating those other people you know, into the process. And for me, it's like if I can sort of remove myself and step back a little bit and just be kind of a team organizer, that, that's a more interesting place to be. I don't know if that answers the question so much, but I mean, just just a quick follow up. Just a quick follow up on that for the viewer, for the for the person coming in the door. Um, of course, bringing whatever you know they, they do from their own, own uh, experiences and, and perspectives. For them, context means a lot mm -hmm. and um, influences the way in which the work is going to be seen. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, we're arguing that, which I would like to think this is true, that it is neither art or science, it's something else. Yeah. And there's a new, there is a new language for that and that there, there is a, a kind of a new aesthetic that, that's emerging that's not mm -hmm. situated in either of those. Mm -hmm. It's not site tied so much to the canons of, of either one. Then somehow the audience also, you know, how do we how do we shift that opportunity for engagement for the audience to complete the work? Because if they're only seeing it as art, or they see it as some hybrid science platform simulation engine with aesthetics, I think it's it would fail. Yeah, I, I also don't, I mean, the aesthetics I don't think are, I mean, we keep using that word, I don't know if they're so important to be talking about the I mean, I think we're past that. Um, you know, as soon, as soon as someone put a urinal in the, you know, in the, in the gallery, that sort of changed the way we thought about aesthetics. Um, but I, I'm fine with it just being art. You know, I mean, because art can incorporate all sorts of things into it. It can, it can, it can incorporate function. We're kind of in an anything goes culture now. Right. I mean, I don't think it necessarily has to even be a hybrid. It can just it can just be art that keeps expanding too. Um, 
I don't know, I go back and forth on thinking about that. That's how I'm thinking of it now. Maybe next week it'll be different. I, I, I don't think there can be a failure. I mean, if you went back and you looked at Van Gogh at the time he's trying to exhibit anything and he can't and nobody's buying his work, um, we could be a total failure right now. That doesn't mean in the long term we're a failure. I mean, it's, history is also a very strange thing here. So really the important thing, I mean, when Adam are doing this, we don't care about the audience. I don't, I don't think we've ever had a discussion about the audience. Maybe we have, but that's yeah. certainly not one of our primary goals. Our primary goals is we're trying to make something that satisfies both of us as deeply and completely as possible. Um, if it stands on its own and it's clear internally what it is trying to do, people we believe will eventually figure that out. Um, there will definitely be people coming in. This is certainly the, what the surveys we've been doing so far show. that They come in with expectations, so they will look at it and say, why is that art? Okay, or they'll look at it and say, why is that science? Or, it, you know, it doesn't, that's fine. But the critical thing is they're actually asking. And if they actually are seriously asking, that's already a step forward. Because then with docents, then with other shows you give in this, this venue and everything else, you can slowly build on that. And maybe over 10 years of people coming in and saying, why, why, why? And then, you know, 10 years from now, the same person comes in and goes, I get it. Okay, we would then be part of that process of getting them to ask the right question that gets them beyond their preconceptions. That's great, um, but that's not the question we're actually trying to address. Well, here at Zero One, we do care about our audience. Yeah, sure. And I want to keep us to time, um, but this was a really fascinating discussion. Please join me in thanking both Adam and Bob for sharing with us. And we do hope that you'll stick around for a while longer. We have food and drinks out for part of the reception. We'd also love it if you'd spend some time with Rebiogenesis Origins of Life. And then like Bob mentioned, there are surveys that can be filled out and um, they'll both stick around to answer your personal questions so that we continue this great conversation um, you know, out into the space. So thank you again for joining us today. And like I said, if you want to sign up for our mailing list, uh, see Sarah at the front desk. Thank you.